Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Continuing here with how the great religions began by Joseph Agar. Part four is Mohammedanism, Flaming Sword of the Desert. And section six is Prophet into Ruler. The Christians count time from A.D. Anadamanai, the year of the Lord, the year Jesus was born in Nazareth, actually probably born 80 years before, but anyways. But the followers of Islam count time neither from the day Muhammad was born, nor from the day of his first vision, nor from the day of his death. They calculate time from A.H., Anu Hegira, the year of the flight, Al-Hijra, is Arabic, so let's have it all one language. Meaning, from the time Muhammad, in his 53rd year, ran away from Mecca to join his followers in Yathrib, and of course be accepted as the leader of a democratic society, um, constitutional democracy, by the way. And that was really the most important year in the life of Muhammad and in the history of the religion. He found it. Of course, how horrible it would be to the ears of any prophet of God to be considered the founder of a religion. Up to that time, up to the time of his flight, Muhammad had been a prophet of a new religion. No, well, not a new religion. He never claimed that. After his, after the flight, he became the founder of its church. A church means they worship him, and that's not ex that kicks you out of Islam. In Mecca, Muhammad was scoffed at and persecuted bitterly, but when he came to Yathrib, he was received with open arms and, proc and proclaimed ruler of the city by about 90% of people who did not buy his prophecy. Did not accept his better way to say it. Even the name of the city was changed from Yathrib to Medina, meaning city of the prophet. Medina just means city. Medina at Nabi is the uh, ex city of the exemplar prophet, the seal of the exemplar prophets. And Medina, the city has remained ever since. In Medina, Muhammad gathered about him, his faithful followers, and began to organize his religion. He was no longer content with reforming only the people of Mecca, but wished to reform all the peoples of Arabia. Though Medina was only half as large as Mecca, it was a better place for Muhammad to organize his work. Medina was a walled city surrounded by fruitful date orchards. There, Muhammad knew he could fortify himself and his followers against hunger and against his enemies. In Mecca, Muhammad had wanted the people to accept him as the prophet of the law. In Medina, he planned to have the people accept him as their uncrowned ruler, maker of their laws, leader of their armies, and judge of all their affairs. In order to establish the power, he organized an army. Well, the political power was the political power. But... To keep up an army, it is necessary to have food and clothes and money. Where was he to get it? Again, they just mustered an army when it was time to defend themselves, not some perpetual war machine like uh, some countries. Muhammad went out to the edge of the desert, wrapped himself in a number of blankets against the chill of the evening, and meditated. As he sat there thinking of ways to support his army, he heard again the voice of the angel Gabriel calling, O oh, thou who art wrapped up, rise up and warn. That's like the second or third part of the Quran, revealed by this time, we're in like number 50, uh, you know, Surah 50 or so that had been learned. So, that does not make sense as a conclusion that he put. But, and Muhammad returned to his followers and told them that the angel of God had come to him and instructed him to go out and waylay the caravans carrying goods from Mecca to foreign lands. Muhammad had spent years as a camel driver in the desert and he knew the paths of the caravans as well as the passes where they could be most easily attacked. 
curse be upon uh, God's curse is upon those who fight to capture resources. That can be an extra that happens, but Muhammad and his followers went out plundering caravans, and whatever they plundered was divided equally among themselves. Uh, among them, the, su su the success of their attacks on the caravans, Muhammad explained to his followers, proved that Allah was with them. Muhammad had or or had organized these pillages to support his army, but he also wanted the robberies to incite the merchants of Mecca and bring out th and bring them out into open battle. Now it wasn't technically robbery because they had taken. They've been driven out of their homes. Their stuff had been left behind. There had been attacking and killing and all this. So it wasn't like, he's they got stuff I want. I'll attack them. No, that's not acceptable. He also wanted the robberies to incite the merchants of Mecca and bring them out into open battle. His plan succeeded. Yes, his plan succeeded. His plan succeeded, but his plan was not, I just want to stir up war. No. They avoided war. If you look at what happened in the case of the wars, you have to admit that even when it came time for self-defense, they were delayed in defending themselves because, you know, they wanted to give up on vengeance and property and all, this other, all these other motivations for warfare. After many of their caravans had been robbed, the Meccans gathered to decide what to do. It is no longer safe for us to send our merchandise to foreign market to for, uh, send our merchandise to foreign markets. They said, and all because of Muhammad, let us declare war upon him. One merchant suggested, he's in Yathrib, and we are in Mecca, nearly 100 leagues away. How can we reach him? Let us hire soldiers and go up to Yathrib and destroy him and his followers to the last man, suggested the merchant. His advice was taken. Soldiers were hired. Spears were given them to fight with, and camels were provided for them to travel on. Fast dromedaries that could, that could pursue the army and overtake him. So obviously they were the aggressors because, uh, honest honestly, if you're defending yourself, you could, you're willing to go out there yourself and... I don't know, I don't want to go out there and defend myself. It's like, yeah, no. Camels were provided, sewers were given them to fight with, and camels were provided for them to travel on fast dr dromedaries that could pursue the army and overtake them. War was declared on Yathrib, called Medina, and on Muhammad its ruler, and, all, and on all the people who followed him. Muhammad had quick had learned of the plan of the Meccans to attack him, and he qu quickly organized his forces to meet their army. In one of the battles with the Meccans, Muhammad almost lost his life. The Meccans that day succeeded in breaking through his ranks and put the Muslims to flight. Return and fight, Muhammad shouted to his men. The prophet of God is here and does not flee. Come back. He was not heeded. His soldiers fled, leaving their leader almost entirely unprotected. A volley of stones and arrows began flying in Muhammad's direction from the Meccan soldiers who had recognized him. A Meccan soldier on horseback rushed up to Muhammad and swung his sword at his head. Just as that moment, one of Muhammad's faithful servants, who had not deserted his master, jumped forward and raised his hand to blow the sword, cut the servant's arm from his body, but Muhammad was saved. The Meccans believed that Muhammad had been killed, and they returned home singing their victory. Their joy did not last long. Their caravans were plundered again, and Muhammad, whom they believed to be dead, was organizing a large army for new wars with his enemies. The enraged Meccans went to war again, but the victory was on the side of Muhammad, who had skillfully organized his army, and with every success in battle, the faith of Muhammad's followers increased. And when the... When the wars with Mecca were over, Muhammad settled in Medina to further the spreading of his religion. Of course, they worked hard to establish a peace treaty with these disbelievers. When the war... To further the spreading of his religion, yes. Through fame and power, though fame and power were his, Muhammad remained unchanged by his success 
At home, he was soft-spoken and gentle. He treated his servants as if they were his own children. At the door of his house, he ordered a bench to be placed, and whosoever came and sat upon it was given food and clothing. He loved children and was never too busy to stop and play with them. And when he and his men were out in the battlefield, though he was their prophet and their leader, he insisted upon doing his share of the work, but in war as in peace, he went on preaching to his followers. He tried to make his teaching so simple that even the most ignorant could understand and follow them. In order to be a good Muslim, a true believer, he preached. There is only There are only five important rules to follow. Believe in Allah and Muhammad his prophet. Pray five times each day. Be kind to the poor and give alms. Keep the fasts during the month of fasts. And make the yearly pilgrimage to Mecca, the holy city. Part 7. The Conquest of Mecca Among the most important commandments of his religion, Muhammad placed the pilgrimage to Mecca. He knew that for centuries his people had considered the Temple of the Black Stone and the Well of Ishmael in Mecca sacred, and that it would please them to continue to keep these places as holy. Besides, in his plans to conquer Mecca, he wished to make it a religious duty for him and his followers to enter the sacred city. What if the Meccans will not permit us to enter and worship in their city? Muhammad was asked by his followers, I, last of the prophets, am sent with the sword. The sword is the key to heaven and hell, and all who draw it in the cause of the faith will be rewarded. Muhammad replied, of course, feasible Allah is according to God's conditions, protecting all those who disbelieve in their places of dis." of worship, you know, as long as they're not attacking us, then they have the right to be protected by us. Well, I went into that elsewhere, and I will go on that again. Eight years after his flight from his birthplace, Muhammad gathered an army of 10,000 armed followers and marched down to Mecca. You know, because the treaty had been violated and people had been killed again. When the news of the approaching army became known to the people of the city, they fled into the hills in terror. Or they stayed in their homes or stayed on the, in the house of work, uh, you know, they grabbed the curtain of the Kaaba and they were safe because Islam doesn't allow war against civilians. When the news of the approaching army became known to the people, they fled into the hills in terror. Mecca was deserted by all its inhabitants. No, it wasn't. Nobody narrated that. And all... And from the surrounding hilltops, the people watched in awe the approach of the great army come from Medina, with their prophet and leader at their head, riding his favorite camel, Al-Kaswa. The army entered the deserted city. They marched through the empty streets directly to the sacred temple. Muhammad stopped his camel before the haughty statue of the idol Habal with the golden hand and pointed at it with his staff he said truth is come and falsehood is fled away and it said it fell and the big idols all fell and then the little ones the 360 and once his followers tore, uh, were smashed by the followers and once his followers tore down the idol uh, tore the idol down and smashed it into pieces muhammad then drove up to the next idol pointed at pointed his staff and repeated truth is come and falsehood is fled away, and his followers destroyed it also. And he went from idol to idol until every one of the 360 idols was demolished. And the people demolished the 360, but the others, the one in Safan Mara, the Hubal, and up on the corner, the goddess statues around the curved wall, and, you know, the various things. Muhammad then ordered his men not to destroy anything in the city, nor to plunder its markets, nor to commit any wrong. And when the people who had fled into the hills came back again and saw that Muhammad had come peacefully to worship at the sacred temple and was not intent upon and was not intent upon murder and robbery, they accepted his teachings, Islam, and acknowledged Muhammad as their prophet and leader. Now the first pilgrimage or was it Umrah? 
well, lesser pilgrimage. Well, anyways, it was a pilgrimage, whether it was a greater or lesser pilgrimage. They did desert the city and leave the Al-Muslimin to be in the city. But then they made the, then was the treaty and, you know, then they would come back and then there'd be mixed pilgrimage and stuff like this. But it wasn't until the final conquest that it was not intended upon murder and robbery. They accepted his teaching Islam and acknowledged Muhammad as the prophet and leader. Eight, the last words of the prophet, Muhammad was beginning to grow old. The blood in his veins had thickened. His walk was no longer bold. His sight began to fail him and he was growing slow of movement, but his ambitions did not diminish. As acknowledged leader and prophet of Arabia, he began to dream of a world empire ruled by Islam. That with the same energy that he organized his forces in Medina, he, ben he began to organize his missionaries to spread his teachings in foreign lands. He even sent a message to the emperor of Rome saying, In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Muhammad, who is the servant of God, to Heraclitus, the emperor of Rome, peace be upon whomever has gone on the straight road. After this I say, Merely I call you to Islam. Embrace Islam and God will reward you to fold, but if you refuse, O oh, ye people of the book, beware, we are Muslims and our religion is Islam. Muslim, mean Muslim, whatever. Um, so there was a series of letters, but only two of like 18 or something like that survived, so, but, you know, this predates what people, it, it proves Muhammad existed as pretty much the only prophet in history that was attested to during his time in the historical record. A few others, but not as uh, the people of other faiths have put them down. Nobody thought that Jesus was divine during his life, as far as anybody knows in the historical sense. And uh, It goes on and on. Uh, Solomon and David were, I guess, historical figures, and but most of the prophets were written about later. To those who were ready to accept Islam peacefully, he sent his blessings. And to those who rejected him, Muhammad sent word saying, I, last of the prophets, am sent with the sword. The sword is the key to heaven and hell. All who draw it in the name of the faith will be rewarded. He wasn't threatening to fight people. He was inviting people to the faith. Um, convert or die was never the message. His army swept through the surrounding country, and within three years, Muhammad had under his rule all of Arabia and many neighboring tribes. At the age of 63, Muhammad felt ill, uh, felt that his end was near. He called his followers together and delivered to them his last message. And yeah, that happened after the final pilgrimage, but he did give a farewell pilgrimage sermon. In this, in, in this message, he repeated what he had often told them before about keeping the faith as it is the will of a law, being kind to the poor, giving the laborer his wage before his perspiration is dry, not to obey anything that is against the faith, for there is no obedience due to sinful commands. You know, as opposed to the Bible thing of wives and slaves, obey your husbands and slave masters. Even in wickedness. No, no, there's none of that. Nor ever to worship idols. He ended his message saying, Yea, people, hearken to my words, for I know not whether after this year I shall ever be among you here again. Remember that the faith is of the heart. A keeper of fast who does not abandon lying and slandering, God careth not about his leaving off eating and drinking. Ye people, hearken unto my speech and comprehend it. Know that every true believer in the faith is the brother of every other true believer. All of you are of the same equality. You are all of one brotherhood. Three months later, Muhammad died. Many of his followers refused to believe that the prophet was dead until Abu Bakr, Muhammad's favorite friend and follower, appeared and said, He who worships Muhammad, let him know that Muhammad is dead, but he who worships Allah, let him know that Allah lives and will not die. And of course, 3, 144, the verse, the, the first one that mentions Muhammad by name, about the faith not being about 
Circuit Messenger being alive. You know, it kind of refutes the whole fanaticism thing. You should read it or listen to it. Then the people believed that their prophet Muhammad had passed away, leaving to them his teachings of the true belief in Allah, the Most High. And of course, Abu Bakr was chosen as caliph after that, largely because of that situation and because of the importance he led into life. Some people thought Ali should be caliph, but uh, more people thought Abu Bakr should, and he got his chance when it was time to, for the people to choose the fourth one, and then his son Hassan became the fifth elected caliph. I mean the third elected caliph, but the fifth in the order. Nine, miracles and wonders. After the death of all the great religious leaders of the past, their followers related wondrous miracles about them. There are the Jetikas, the birth legends of the Buddha. There are the tales and miracles about the birth, life, and death of Moses, Zoroaster, and Jesus. But none of the religious leaders of the past are there so many legends of miraculous happenings as about Muhammad. In Arabia, Persia, and China, and every land where Muhammad's teachings have followers, there are books of legends about the founder of Islam. Most of the legends are about the birth and infancy of Muhammad. There is one story about the king and ministers of Persia were out one night studying the starlit sky when suddenly there appeared a single star so bright that it rivaled the sun with its light. The king and ministers looked at each other in wonder and said, Not otherwise, but that a great prophet has been born. When they looked again, they saw that the new star was in the direction of Mecca. That happened at the hour Muhammad was born. And when Muhammad was born, another story tells, the mountains began to dance and sing. There is no God but Allah. The trees whispered happily to each other. And Muhammad is his prophet. Now, if this happened in a way that humans didn't perceive it, but of course, there's meaning to look at in these stories that may be more important than whether or not they occurred. These were happily to each other. Muhammad is... Prophet. And all the birds that fly gathered around Mecca to sing their praise of Allah, and all the creatures that swim raised their heads above the water and exclaimed, The time has arrived, now the word has a light to lead it. Even the monstrous fish, Tamusa, was very happy. Tamusa, as is well known, is the king of all creatures that swim in the sea. Tamusa has 700,000 tails, and his back is so enormous that 700,000 bullocks with golden horns run, up, run around upon it, and he does not even feel them. When Muhammad was born, Tamusa began to splash the sea with all his 700,000 tails and nearly overturned the earth in his great joy, and at that and that he might have done had not Allah quieted Tamusa in time. Now it's possible that somebody could have taken the early Marduk and Tammuz stories and kind of mixed that in. But this is not from sound Islamic narration. And it's doesn't make sense in a physical sense that this would actually be the case. There's modern science that's kind of refuted that. But again, what does it mean when something's not sound as far as Islamic narration? There could still could be some meaning that could be referred to, some truth that's being indirectly mentioned. When Muhammad was an infant, many visitors came to see him. But when his face was unveiled, the people had come to cover their eyes quickly to avoid being blinded by the brightness that shone from the face of the child. And 7,000 angels, disguised as little boys and girls, came to Muhammad's home, bringing with them a golden vessel filled with heavenly dew. In this vessel, the child Muhammad was bathed. That was why he was always clean. When he awoke each morning, his face was clean as if it had just been washed, and his hair was combed and in order. Later, when Muhammad was a shepherd and a camel driver in the desert, he never suffered in the heat because a little cloud always hung low to cast a shadow to protect him wherever he went during the heat of the day. At night, Muhammad's eyes were like two searchlights. When anything was dropped in the dark, Muhammad could bend down and pick it up as easily as if the sun had shone upon that spot. Once Muhammad and his followers were in the desert, when night came, Muhammad, who was very modest, 
would not undress in the presence of his men, he arose and looked out far to the north. He could see a tree, and far to the south he saw another. Muhammad called the two trees together, and there came near and formed a screen between him and his followers. And, of course, we were all commanded to be modest. At least a minimal, you know, knees to bottom half of the belly, all the men, and, you know, women, their parts too. And there are 319, at least, soundly narrated narrations. I mean, you look into the history of who's passing it on and that sort of thing. There's at least 319 rather sound narrations in that regard, but I don't remember whether this is one of them. After conquering Mecca, Muhammad was presented with the bow upon which an eagle, a bow upon which an eagle had been painted. Muhammad, who preached against all idols, images, and pictures, did not wish to take the picture into his house, but he did wish to keep the present that had been given him. So he placed his hand upon the bow, and immediately the eagle came to life and flew away, leaving the bow clean for Muhammad to keep. When Muhammad died, its bed was moved aside, and his grave dug exactly underneath the spot where he died. As the grave diggers dug deep into the ground, they found a stone whose radiance could be seen from a great distance. That stone was placed on Muhammad's grave. And of course, in Islam... Diagonally across the hand, ding, ding, you know, the longest length across the hand is the long, biggest the gravestone should be, according to Islamic tradition, of what, you know, what the Prophet Muhammad said. That's what I mean by actual Islamic tradition, not, there's conservative tradition, which is indirect, but anyways. These stories and thousands of stories like these are told lovingly about Muhammad and his followers, Muhammad by the followers of Islam, also called Muhammadanism. Chapter 10, The Growth of Islam. When Muhammad was born, Arabia was full of idols, stargazers, soothsayers, fortune tellers, and fakirs of every kind. Of course, the perpetual begging thing that where, when you don't need it and just trying to be poor and begging so you don't keep possessions, that's not an acceptable behavior in Islam. When Muhammad died, idolatry had been rooted out of the land, and the belief in one God was firmly plant, uh, planted firmly in the hearts of the people. The drunkenness and gambling that were popular when Muhammad was young were banished by his teachings during the short time of his rule. And thus, you know, you can't say, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm joining religion to quit a couple things. No, when you join religion to join uh, to do the right thing, period, then a lot of things follow. You know, a lot of things are good or kept up, and a lot of bad things are quit. To his followers after his death, Muhammad left his speeches or sermons that were written down by the faithful Abu Bakr and gathered into a book called the Quran, meaning the reading. And I don't know, I think most of his speeches were completely lost. The Quran was passed on and was focused on and written down during the time. And there were various manuscripts, but I mean literally 500 in recorded history were recorded and it's all the same to the letter. The book called the Quran, meaning the reading. The Quran became the sacred scriptures of Islam. Immediately after Muhammad's death, Abu Bakr became the successor to the Prophet. He was called Caliph, which means the shadow of God on earth. Um, the vicegerent, the the successor, the continuer, but. I'm not sure how that meaning comes about. Caliph Abu Bakr sent armies to Syria and to Persia and to northern Africa to spread Islam. Well, to spread Islamic style rule, and therefore Islam was preached there, but there was persecution going on in Persia and various places. And when Abu Bakr died, his successors continued the holy wars. Again, not acceptable in Islam. There's no before the Crusades, nobody wrote of holy wars in the Arabic language. Just far as anybody knows, except maybe among the Christian community. Spreading the gospel of Muhammad. No, spread, spreading justice. And Islam was practiced openly where they went to. So. Before a hundred years after Muhammad's death were over, the religion he founded had conquered Syria in the north, and from there it traveled to Egypt in the west. From Egypt it traveled to Tunis, Tripoli, and Algeria. It came to Persia, to India, and China, and it made its way to Europe and reached Spain. The spread of Islam continued for many, many years, and though in Europe it was stopped 
by fierce wars against it, it still spreads now in Africa and in the tropical countries. As long as Islam remained in Arabia among the Arabs, it was a unified religion. Yeah, that's that's why the Abadi and the uh, Quaritch and a bunch of other groups appeared. But the religion was unified, some sectarian and political divisions. Political divisions preceded, like, the Shia and the Sunni and... And a, and a lot of groups. But when it began to spread beyond Africa and brought under its rule different people like the Negroes, Kurds, um, don't the Negroes, aren't they from Africa? Or, I mean, isn't that the, uh, the country where those races are? Kurds, Caucasians, Mongols, Chinese, and Hindus, various sects begin to arise. Today, there are over 150 sects of Islam. There's over 300 Shia groups. There's over 300 Sufi groups. I mean, one guy was a member of over 150 of them. Um, there's probably as many Sunni groups. And I don't mean masjids, I, I mean, you know. And reformists, there's probably as many reformists. The number of true believers, Muslims, in the various sects is estimated to be 250 million, or a little over one-seventh of the entire population of the world. And next to Christianity is the most active, most growing, and most important religion in existence. And I...